Okay, so now that we've looked at um, sort of an introduction, looking at um, the emergence of this kind of new phase of capitalism, what's referred to as late capitalism, we also looked at the move from um, you know, manufacturing in this sort of early phase of capitalism where it was mostly about organization to eventually the application of technology. We also looked at um, the beginning of um, the assembly line and kind of how mass production was eventually emerging. So now what we're going to look at is the emergence of the modern corporation. And there's four new key concepts that we have to look at. Monopoly, oligopoly, vertical integration, and horizontal integration. I'll talk a little bit about the first two. Um, the second two, vertical and horizontal integration, I'm not going to explain yet, um, largely because I think it's easier if I just show you how it works rather than explain it. So monopoly, of course, is something that probably most of you have figured out what it means. It's when a particular market and a particular industry is controlled basically by one corporation. It doesn't mean it controls 100% of the market, but you're talking 70, 80, 90% of it. Um, so an uh, interesting example in the case of monopoly was Standard Oil. Standard Oil at one point in the United States controlled 90% of the oil market, right? So that last 10% was smaller corporations, probably many of which did business with and were dependent on Standard Oil. Now, a lot of these monopolistic businesses were broken up by the US government in the early 20th century which led to kind of different um, organizational way, uh, organization of the economy, which is oligopolies. And oligopolies is basically when an entire industry or sector of the economy is controlled by a very few amount of corporations, between two to eight, nine, sometimes 10, but usually around five to six giant corporations. And again, they don't necessarily control 100% of the business, but they can control well over 70, 80 to 90% um, percent of it by a few specific companies. To begin with. And again, I'm going to talk about vertical and horizontal integration when we get to it because I just think it's easier for you to see how it works rather than for me to kind of um, explain it. All right, so as the reading looked at, uh, made clear, some of the earliest large corporations were actually the railway companies. So if we look at the emergence of rail in the United States, we can see here just the railroad boom that took place after the Civil War. You can see this is 1870, this is all the rail lines, and then this is 1890, just massive expansion. So by 1900, the U.S. had more track laid than all of Europe, including Russia combined. Every state and nearly every city was eventually connected by rail, allowing for a national system of distribution to transport people and goods rapidly across the country. And of course, this is key for the emergence of these massive corporations, as the Chandler reading uh, made clear, right? That it creates, and I'll talk about this more in a minute, this idea of a national market emerges out of the creation of this massive railway network in the mid to late 19th century. And the railway companies did this by taking advantage of land and loan subsidies from the federal, state, and local governments. They borrowed heavily by selling stocks and public bonds to the public. By 1900, yearly interest payments by railways were as much as the American federal government's budget um, at this point. So. What was also key with railroads was aside from raising massive amounts of capital and pioneering new ways to raise capital by offering um, stock to the public, they also looked at new ways of pioneering systems for collecting and using information to coordinate thousands of cars across the country. They created an elaborate accounting system, documented every cost, everything from coal consumption to the, to, um, the uh, uh, to how well engines were running and which cars were where. By using this system, they were one of the first businesses to be able to predict profits accurately. And they were able to do this as early as the 1860s, when most companies at that time had no idea what their earnings would be until they opened the books at the end of the year. Right? So this idea that they were collecting so much information because they had to in order for the business to operate, that they could pretty accurately predict how much they were gonna earn by the end of the year. Now these management techniques would of course become standard uh, by other industries. Now, the railroads influenced the industry in other ways, beyond just how business is operated, but also its corporate organization. And despite these innovations, the railroad industry was largely chaotic in the 1870s. Hundreds of small companies had different track gauges, different engine sizes. There was little, if any, standardization, at least initially. And as I said, this is the era where standardization starts to take effect and it's largely what made possible these massive industrial enterprises and this emerging standardization starts in the railway industry largely because these different railway companies it was so chaotic there was no standardization so if you were on say one um, 
train going, say, west, and then you had to switch to another company. You had to get out of the train, get on a different train, because the track was a different gauge. And what the gauge meant was the distance by which the track, one rail, was apart from the other. So obviously, if the gauge was different, only locomotives from or trains from one company could operate on one um, rail system, right? It wasn't as integrated, at least initially. So as a result, the railway industry began to consolidate with financing from Eastern and British banks. Railway barons like Collis Huntington, who if you travel all over California, you'll see all sorts of buildings with the name Huntington on it, and Jay Gould started to buy up the competition and created larger integrated track networks. By 1893, west of the Mississippi, all the rail, so that's everything west of here. This is New Orleans here. Everything west, so this whole area of the United States, that was five railway companies by that point. This again allowed for greater standardization in track gauge, engines, air brakes, and the signaling system. They began to standardize everything and it allowed these railways to operate more smoothly. Now states tried to regulate them to stop the corruption, the price favors. That's one thing about these rail companies. They were incredibly corrupt. In fact, at one point it was estimated that something like $300 million was skimmed off the top of federal money and subsidies for railway companies in the 1860s and 70s. Um, but the Supreme Court ruled that states could not regulate commerce, so the U.S. government passed the Interstate Commerce Act of 1887, which banned monopolistic activity. Now, these competitions weakened further in 1893 because of the massive depression. Um, before the Great Depression of the 1930s, often the 1893 depression was thought of as the Great Depression, and Chandler talks about that in the reading. Now, most of these railroads in this era were bought up by investment banker J. Pierpont Morgan. Now, you may recognize his name. You probably know the modern bank called J.P. Morgan. Well, this is where J.P. Morgan comes from. Um, J. Pierpont Morgan was kind of the a pioneer of finance in the United States, and he will become essential to the organization of massive corporations in the early 20th century, not just the railroads. And what he did was he refined their debts and built inter-system inter alliances. By 1906, under Morgan, um, rail was centralized under and management was centralized in these railway companies in seven giant networks. Now, of course, this led to other industries. Many of these methods will go to the other industries, the idea of controlling costs and understanding all aspects of production. The key things that emerged out of U.S. corporate strategies in this period, especially the idea of cutting costs and knowing what your costs were, was pioneered by railway companies. Now, of course, what you need to build is a lot of material at this point. So what we're going to see here now is we'll move from the railway companies into other companies because a lot of these te management techniques and ways for organizing and consolidating businesses again starts with the railway companies. And of course what's essential um, with the creation of this large uh, rail network is what makes possible the emergence of these other industrial behemoths, right? What they did was create a national urbanized market. Chandler really emphasizes that a lot um, in the article, right? That the reason these large corporations emerged was about them meeting the demands of a national market spread across an entire continent. And not just a national market, but an increasingly urbanized market. This is the period in the United States when cities start to expand rapidly. Um, cities like Chicago, for example, in the 1840s and 1850s had a few hundred thousand, but by the late 19th century was upwards of two, three million people um, in some of these cities. They just grew absolutely rapidly, similar to how cities in Asia have grown in the last 20, 30, 40 years. Although in the case of Asia, it's even on a larger uh, scale uh, at this point. And this is what rail made possible, right? And it also meant an end, the end to the railway boom meant finished goods shifted, as we'll see later. Um, a lot of the emerging U.S. steel industry initially focused on selling to railroads, but as Chandler makes clear in the reading, eventually they start selling to urban markets, urban markets that were created by this emerging national rail network, which created a national market in the United States. So this brings us to the concept of vertical integration. And I'm going to get there in just a minute, but if we look at this specific slide, there were challenges of mass production, right? The railway, once it eventually was built, as I said, created this mass market. So it meant that a lot of corporations, no matter where you were in the United States, potentially was able to reach the entire country. All of a sudden, the entire country was a potential market. And these corporations were organized and responded to the creation of that market so that they could meet the demands of that market. And we're going to look at a few examples um, of challenges in mass um, production, and specifically continuous production. So if we look at the case of raw materials, 
we're going to look at, in some cases, steel. And in the case of steel, a lot of what this was was securing access to raw materials. And to do that, they integrated themselves vertically. Um, and I'm going to explain what that means more in a minute. And in the case of something like, say, cigarettes, which is um, uh, Duke, basically, a man named uh, Duke, was a pioneer of the early American cigarette industry, it was concerns over overproduction which led Duke and his company to integrate themselves vertically. So I'm just going to show you a slide about what vertical integration actually is. So if we look at it, this is how vertical integration works. It's, it's, it operates vertically backwards and forwards in the production process. So for example, if we have a manufacturer right here, right, that manufacturer Right? If what you're making is a specific product, well, you have to buy things in order to make that product. So then what you do to integrate yourself vertically is you invest in, buy, or create companies to import the product. Right? Um, so suppliers here at this point, commodity producers. So for example, if we look at, we'll look at the steel industry um, at one point, but what you would want to do is buy the raw materials that are necessary for producing your product. Buy the shipping lines or the rail lines that will bring your product, your raw materials to your factory to be assembled. Then you will invest in importers and distribution, stores and eventually buyers. So what you've done is you've integrated the business vertically, right? From the raw materials that are required to make whatever it is you're making, to the manufacturing process, to importing it and distributing it across the country or across the world, and then potentially eventually buying even the stores that sell it. This is what vertical integration means, right? You buy up other companies or create other companies in that vertical chain of manufacturing, right? So for example, like I said, if you need to buy raw material and supply instead of buying it from a separate company you just buy that company or you create a company that does the same thing this is what vertical integration actually is it you are integrated vertically now the first example we're going to look at here um, is the meatpacking industry and again the meatpacking industry was one of the industries that pioneered this concept of the assembly line so what we see with the meatpacking industry is Basically, they are about controlling all aspects of production. So if we look at an example here, this is the Union Stockyards in Chicago, and this is a view of Swift and Company's packing house. You can see there's massive corporations. But if we go to the next slide, this is kind of what they looked like. This is 1900, the Chicago Stockyards. Now, what they were able to do was integrate themselves vertically. But in the case of the meatpacking industry, it was towards selling. So for example, meatpacking was a new product. And as Swift makes, um, as uh, Chandler makes clear in the article, is that they had to create demand. So the two examples we're going to look at in terms of manufacturing demand is the meatpacking industry and then the cigarette industry. So when the meatpacking plants emerged in the mid to late 19th century, this was a new product. Most people up until the mid to late 19th century, certainly the early 20th century, most of the meat that was bought was probably bought at a local butcher. Now what the meatpacking industry does is it essentially industrializes the process of butchering animals. So now products are bought and sold on a mass scale. You don't have to go to a local butcher. You can go to a general store. You can go to what eventually will become the supermarkets to buy um, these meat products. And so what had to happen in the case of um, the meatpacking industry, and again, Swift is a good example, is they had to invest their money in distribution and marketing specifically. And if we look at the next example, part of the way they invested in distribution, and this is why the railway network was key to the vertical integration of these companies, was the emergence of the loaded refrigerated boxcar in the 1880s. And this is what made these meatpacking industry possible, and why you didn't necessarily have to go to a local butcher anymore. Right? Part of the reason you went to a local butcher was because the butcher would buy probably from local farmers beef, pork, lamb, whatever. They'd have it in a massive freezer, and then they would butcher the animal for you. Right? Now, what this meant with the emergence of the refrigerated boxcar was that meat could be transported across the country hundreds and sometimes thousands of miles. So that a massive operation like the Swift 
plant in Chicago could distribute all its product all over the United States through a branch, a branch plant system often sometimes, but the refrigerated boxcar meant that animal products could be refrigerated and shipped over hundreds and thousands of miles in a few days. So things that were produced in Chicago could be sold to market in New Orleans or New York City or the West Coast. So what this did was create distribution. And of course, again, the railway network was essential to the emergence of this distribution network. Now, if we look at a diagram of how this actually worked, we have here Shift, uh, Swift Chicago plant, the railway ice houses, right? The transportation, the refrigerated boxcars. And then what he had to do was create a marketing and advertising department. And the reason he creates a marketing and advertising department is because this is a new product. You have to let people know that this new product exists. And not only that, you had to normalize it, right? Just like when a new industry emerges, a lot of people weren't so sure about buying meat that came from 500 miles away, right? For the reasons I just said, with the local butcher. So they had to advertise a lot, explain how the refrigerated boxcar worked, how that this meat was not only safe, but actually it was very cheap because they're producing it on a much larger and mass scale. So they had to educate the public. And in doing so, they created marketing and advertising. They invested a ton of money in marketing and advertising. So again, you can see this is a vert form of vertical integration. Now this form of vertical integration is toward the market. Okay, so this is production, transportation, distribution,